Previously on the Sugar Baby Confessionals. If you are able to kind of close your mind and body off from each other, either to get through whatever's happening or whatever else, then that kind of neural pathway in your brain opens up and it becomes a lot easier to do that in terms of lots of other things. For Ruby's husband, it's his favourite person place now jeopardised because he was favourite person because of their love. And if she, how does your brain actually know every single time who to disassociate with. Can they honestly say they never ever disassociate with their partner? They never ever try and connect with someone that they're sleeping with? I just think it's quite, it's such a complicated mm. dynamic when you've got to actively choose when to be present and part of that moment with someone. You don't have to rush into gang bangs and fisting. And I think the intimate, seductive appeal of the late night DM and you're tweeting from your, you know, your little bed, your darkened bedroom. I think people don't want to have the hassle of actually meeting up. You can just kind of fuck via DM. And intellectually, it makes sense. Polyamory, you're spreading the love, you're getting what you need from each person. Emotionally, for me, I would be throwing myself under several trains. This is why sex work is dangerous, because people are using their morality and their opinions to make laws. Sex workers are happy in their jobs, but the only thing that makes them unhappy is the rules and regulations surrounding sex work, which stops us being able to work together. And that is where we are psychologically hurt, because if we want to report abuse, we don't know whether we're going to be prosecuted for being sex workers. Your podcast and our podcast, it is opening my mind, and mm. I love that. It's been a year since Madeline and I last caught up for the podcast. I'm interested in finding out what's happened to her in that time. How did the experiment that she and Ruby have planned pan out? Remember, she'd all but given up the whole sugar baby thing. Finding the process of sorting the wheat, rich sugar daddies, from the chaff, chances looking for a cheap date, exhausting. Ruby would suggested that she change her profile to indicate that she was in a relationship already, and therefore... These lusty Lotharios would be able to infer that she meant business. Pleasure too, but you know, for money. Did she get a deluge of wealthy bed partners that changed her mind about quitting the whole thing? Is she now living in a mansion in Bel Air, having grapes peeled for her as she reclines in a gold-plated bathtub full of champagne? Join me now as we journey into the future and visit with Madeline for the last time. This is the Sugar Baby Confessionals. When was the last time we spoke about your sugar baby escapades? Goodness. The last time we talked, I was sort of taking a step back from the whole thing. I was finding it very fake and, and frustrating. And Ruby gave me a bit of advice about how to change up my profile just slightly. And I ended up meeting somebody just in mm. time for my birthday. Hold on a sec. There was a really weird noise. It was like being in the belly of a whale. Have you ever been in the belly of a whale? Many times. <laughs> and that's how I know. <laughs> so sorry. So you were saying Ruby had given you some advice. Ruby had given me a bit of advice about how to change up my profile a bit. And um, right after I implemented that, I met somebody and it was right around the time of my birthday. And so you, you say that as though you meeting this person led to the end of you being a sugar baby. Is that, is that what happened? Oh, no, no, no. I changed my profile and then I met a potential sugar daddy who ended up being a sugar daddy for me. Okay. So what happened with that? It uh, was actually great. And he's a great guy. He ended up getting a job that takes him halfway across the country most of the time and actually out by you as well. So um, we just really haven't seen each other. And that's kind of okay with me. That experience was pretty excellent. So when you say you changed your profile because of Ruby's advice, what changes exactly did you make? She had recommended that I change it to say that I have somebody in my life that I'm in a relationship. And it sort of gives the impression, which is, it was true. I mean, I was talking about the marquee. It gives the impression that we're not talking about a young woman out in the world alone, which I think in many cases, dissuades a certain type of man from contacting you. In a way, that's kind of a sad indictment of it. It's like all the creeps and weirdos are like, eh, no, there's someone in her life. We can't. You know, right. she's not She's not vulnerable. The prey is not, you know. <laughs> it's not yeah, exactly. It's not the same kind of prey. But it also, um, I think, weeds out a certain type of man who is actually, or at least says he's there looking for a relationship because I really was not 
looking for a regular relationship. I don't want to text you every day or, you know, that sort of thing. So my arrangement ended up being, you know, he was in my area and available and I would go and spend time with him. And we had a very lovely relationship, but it wasn't, we didn't text all the time. We didn't talk all the time. We didn't see each other every week. Right. And so, so you felt like that really made a huge difference and, and you ended up getting into a relationship with somebody that, a sugar daddy that really worked for you. I would tell you that it made a huge difference. It really drastically reduced the amounts of people contacting me. And so I had less to weed out in terms of who was for real and who was just on the web pretending. Okay, so you're still a sugar baby. You're still kind of open for business, as it were. I have not done the sugar baby thing in a while since my, I don't even know what to call him, the surfer. Sugar daddy number five, the surfer. Since the surfer and I, I wouldn't even say we parted ways. We just sort of, you know, life happens. And I haven't since then found anyone that I was particularly into in the same way. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of been an important part of this whole thing. He set a good bar for everyone else. We haven't talked about this new sugar daddy before, so I asked Madeline to describe him for me. He's a financial person in a pretty metropolitan city. And goodness, he's probably six one dirty blonde graying hair he's a bit older than i am he's about uh 55 now and he married children but i think based on our conversations in this could be you know nonsense but anything anybody says could be nonsense his marriage is one of you know it's a business relationship and there's so much financially between them that it would be really difficult to disentangle all of that has the surfer told Madeline this because it's easier to have the veneer of some story, a reason why he's paying for her time, or is this genuinely the case? I don't mean this to be a critique. I'm just genuinely interested in how many sugar daddies own what they're doing. Is subterfuge a common part of these transactions, and does that add to the frisson of excitement for them? Madeline tells me that, as far as she knows, there is no sexual interaction between the surfer and his wife. I wonder to what extent a lot of these guys would say that even if it weren't true. Well, that's that's kind of what I was implying is that that's what he yeah. told me, whether or not that was the case. I, I don't know, because that seems to be a common thing among married men is that, oh, you know, my wife doesn't pay attention to me. I don't get laid enough, et cetera, et cetera. And whether or not it's true is probably anybody's guess. Well, this is what I'm interested in. I mean, I wonder if it is something that these guys just, decide is a good thing to tell a woman even if there is even if you're quite honest about the fact that this is a financial arrangement and so you don't have to lie maybe it's kind of like a thing or is it is it just that at this sort of point in people's lives a lot of times they do kind of drift apart sexually lose that kind of connection or whatever you know what I mean either way it's kind of a slightly depressing isn't it it definitely kind of is but I think a lot of people when they're together for a certain amount of time, they're not growing together, they're growing apart. I think, and this is, you know, a really broad generalization about women, but we go through, you know, a life change. We go through menopause and our sex drive is, is not the same. And then here's your husband sort of hanging out there going, but, but wait, I, I was used to X, Y, Z and now I'm getting ABC. I think it's very difficult to reconcile that for a lot of people. You don't know how to handle it, whether or not you still are totally in love with your partner, you go seek that affection elsewhere because you want it, you need it. Not that I think that necessarily makes it right, but I feel that there are a lot of men who are looking for something that they're not getting at home, even though they don't really want to rock the boat at home. One thing I can sympathize with in terms of the sugar daddies, though I don't condone the lying and so on, is the fact that I'm one of those people for whom the lack of physical intimacy actually causes physical and emotional suffering. That sounds a bit dramatic, but I, I really mean it. I start to go into a decline like an ailing Victorian lady. Hey, maybe that's why they were ailing. So if your partner can't or won't provide you with that tactility and the connection that comes from it, it must be very tough to maintain a strong bond. Personally, I'd still be in favor of honesty, therapy, or other solutions before going behind your partner's back, but my point is, I guess I can relate to this need for touch. God, 
I never thought I'd end up comparing myself to the sugar daddies. Here, where I lived for the longest time, we, that was grounds for divorce. It's called constructive abandonment. So I think at some level, people understand that, but at the same time, nobody wants to be the person who is, and I'm air quoting here, betrayed. I did speak to, meet, talk to, whatever, a couple of men who had their their partners or wives' permission. And mm. although that is that was very uncommon. I mean, so for I, whatever reason, they had worked out that they had different needs or they wanted to have a more adventurous sex life for both of them or whatever. Well, I guess we're seeing with Ruby this kind of it playing out. and Right. Yep, that's um, true. I'm quite interested to see when I talk to her a recap on where she is now that she's decided to kind of, you know, give up all the other sugar daddies and, and continue with just one. And also that she's developing these very real and deep feelings for him. Mm hmm. So I think it will be fascinating to find out if, if this is something that can work. People like Dan Savage from the Savage Love Cast, he's always talking about how he thinks you just never hear about the positive side, the positive sides of affairs. Some affairs, you know, can like reinvigorate a marriage. If, if, I have heard that as well. He's right. You never do hear those stories. You only hear the stories where it's a terrible betrayal and it ruins the marriage and the trust is gone and all that kind of thing. I feel like that's a bit of Hollywood that – in the movies, in television, stories like the affair that hurts somebody is a much juicier story than the affair that's acceptable or approved or known about. Yeah, I mean, heartbreak is a universal thing, right? It's the thing right. that can any everyone can relate to and the intricacies of that and how and whose fault was it and what leads up to it and the tension and the all of that kind of thing makes for very good drama. But the problem is when it's in real life, it's almost like well lit <laughs> and the musical it's score isn't quite as good. And it's just not as dramatic and betraying as we sometimes think it is. I mean, frequently it is, don't get me wrong. But there are things that are just physical. I'm sure I've said before that there's definitely a difference between sex and love. And sometimes you just need that physicality, like you said. And it doesn't always matter where it comes from or how you get it. But then you can go back into your life and be a better husband and father for, well, men can be a better husband or father than they were prior to that because their, their needs are fulfilled. Where are the sugar mummies out there? Is that a thing too? Knowing how important sexual connection is to me, and trying to imagine if I were in a situation where my husband and I had drifted apart physically and emotionally, I mean, I know there must be women out there who pay for sex or companionship. The trope of a toy boy is a well-established thing and that must come from somewhere. Certainly there are women who have affairs behind their partner's backs. I used to wonder about Dorothea and Mr. Casubon from my favorite novel Middle March by George Eliot. Mr. Casabon is an academic, a dry old stick who wins the young Dorothea as a bride because she looks up to him intellectually. I always inferred that physically, there would be very little going on between them, hence her attraction to the young, passionate Will Ladislaw. <sighs> God, I love that book. Uh, anyway, where were we? You know, I didn't mean to imply that it was men and not women. I just meant that I was dealing with men and not women. So this yeah, is sure, my experience, but I absolutely think that women are capable of it, and I think that uh, you are in a good arrangement, I don't mean to say arrangement, a, a good relationship <laughs> where you want that from your partner. I think if you're so far gone yeah. that you've loved this person for so long, but you're just not getting your needs met, it's a very different situation. I think that there is a, you, know, you would feel a certain way about your husband. You love him. You always love him. You want him to be happy. But at the same time, you can't really forgo your own happiness and your own needs. Because mm, it, can, it can make you a bit crazy. Yes. Did you ever have an experience like that, like in your own life? Do you mean? Like with any uh, other partners that you had? Did you ever have a relationship that kind of worked on the other levels, but like maybe the sexual side of things weren't? Many. <laughs> Actually, several. And it, I think for me, a lot of times 
it has to do with, you know, some, I mean, it, I think this is probably true for everybody, but the way that I address it might be different. I, I think that a lot of times there would be something going wrong in the relationship and then I would feel the need or th- that I would feel that this, this sex was subpar for me. There was a, that whale sound again. <laughs> was it a cock? Oh, but... I know what you're hearing. What is it? It's, is it the bats? No, I live on a very busy street. And when the trucks go past my house, they use the, they call it a jeek break. And it's noisy. I thought it was a weird bat sonar noise or something. Because you, I know you had some bats. No, and I didn't even notice it when you said it the first time because I'm so blissfully unaware of it now where when I first moved into this house, it was a constant, like I could hear the, hear the traffic all the time and now barely hear it at all. So I was like, what is she talking about? But now that you said the timing was right, that I, I understood what you meant. Definitely not a whale. <laughs> How did you deal with it when you experienced it yourself? Like, what did you? I think when when talking about it doesn't hasn't worked. That's when I sort of I would call it lash out and, and find somebody else to meet those needs, which is not the right way for me to handle my relationships. But other times, you know, talking talking works. But I feel like when communication gets screwed up for me in a relationship, it really affects the sex. Mm-hmm. It's very difficult for me to communicate my needs. So if we could get the communication back on track, then things have been sort of you know, fine. And if uh, if we can't, then I sort of look elsewhere to have those needs met. Speaking of looking elsewhere, <laughs> yeah. how's the Marquis doing? <laughs> he is, our relationship has very much changed since we spoke, and, and in a good way. I'm so delighted to hear this. Ruby and I have long been worried about Madeline's relationship with the Marquis. There's so many ways she could potentially be hurt by him. He's her boss, so the power dynamic is messed up. He seems incapable of honesty when it comes to seeing other people behind her back. So I'm gagging to find out what's changed between them. He has developed the idea that at some point this could all go away. I'm still a free agent. And now when we spend time together, it's much more meaningful, much more substantial than the way it was before. Where it was kind of like in and out and no pun intended, like in the door, have sex and leave. It's really not that way anymore, which is both harmful and fantastic. Oh, no. So how has it evolved? If you kind of like look back on your relationship with him, do you feel differently about him now? Are you kind of... Because at the time, you sort of seemed like you were kind of stuck. I was. And I think part of what has changed in him is my willingness to move on. Should the right thing come my way, I'm not going to let him delay me. And I think that that he sort of figured that out, decided to believe it. And now he's much more interested in the things that make me me apart from just my reproductive system. Not exactly a ringing endorsement, is it? That the Marquis, after all this time, is deigning to expend a little effort in getting to know Madeline seems like the bare minimum. And yes, I meant bear, as in buck naked. Yep, I'm back, baby. Puns and all. I mean, he wasn't interested in your your reproductive system, right? I mean, he was well, interested. No, of course in- not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no. I was just thinking, was there a bit in the story that we missed where it was like the part where he's wanting to impregnate you and he's decided that he wants another child and you're going to Let me be- rephrase. <laughs> he is much more interested in me as a whole person than he is in just my sex organs. In fact, he is not capable of having more children, <laughs> thankfully. It sounds like you're ready for a new relationship. I might be if the, you know, if the right thing came along. And the truth is, I, I don't know how I would cease to love the Marquis. I, I have no ability to do that. The fact that she's still seeing the Marquis, that she believes at one and the same time that A, their relationship has deepened, but also that B, she could find a fulfilling relationship without him. That's what Ruby and I want for her so much. But she says she loves him, and somehow that means she's bound in metaphysical handcuffs or velvet ropes, but bound all the same. This truly is the dark side of love, this blind yearning. 
in spite of everything the other person does, how they betray or let you down. It reminds me of Dorothy Parker's poem, A Certain Lady. Oh, I can smile for you and tilt my head and drink your rushing words with eager lips and paint my mouth for you a fragrant red and trace your brows with tutored fingertips. When you rehearse your list of loves to me, oh, I can laugh and marvel rapturous-eyed. And you laugh back, nor can you ever see the thousand little deaths my heart has died. And you believe so well I know my part that I am gay as morning, light as snow. And all the straining things within my heart, you'll never know. Oh, God. Uh, so I'm totally wrong. You're still oh, completely stuck on him. I'm not completely stuck in the sense that I know that if I have some sort of relationship, then things with the marquee have to change. And that's what I was getting at, that he's sort of accepted and, and become very aware of now, is that I'm willing to do that if the right person comes along. Like, I haven't shut myself off to other people. He likes the idea of me going out and having sex with people and telling him about it, and that's great for him. But I'm not there anymore. I'm not interested in telling him about any of my partners or dates or whatever happens to me because that's between me and that person and not the Marquis. So he's sort of out of that loop. I think that was very eye-opening for him. Wow, so there's, there has been a shift, but it's not as dramatic. In some ways it's worse because it will be much harder to let go of him now that he's in ever increasing age, which is all of us, but you know, he's a grown person. He's you know, in his mid fifties and he should be able to understand the difference between sex and a relationship and what we were having before was a relationship. And when I sort of said, okay, I'm ready to part with this if needs be, he went, well, well wait a minute. <laughs> and I think it sort of changed the way that he deals with me now. He is not as interested in meeting me just for the sake of, of sex. Like his first concerns are, are my other needs being met. Is there enough food in my refrigerator when on the days when that was used to be a problem? Um, you know, if I, I recently had some surgery and he's checked in with me every single day to say, what's going on? Are you okay? Do you need anything? Which is something of a different tone to our relationship. To be clear, he's never going to leave his wife. He's never going to like... As far as I know, no. Like we, we've had this conversation where if he won the lottery, <laughs> he would probably set her up and leave. But it would be much too complicated for him to do that. And so, again, I'm sure I've said this before, too. Like, that's never been an expectation. It's just that, you know, someone else is married to my husband. <laughs> wow. Madeline actually considers herself married to the Marquis in spirit, if not in fact, a belief he appears to be encouraging by giving her just enough crumbs of affection and care to keep her from truly cutting the cord and moving on. As Rebecca Bunch sings in the brilliant TV show Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, How do I know he loves me? It's the little things, little compliments here and there that I secretly stockpile in my woman brain. The love kernels. Because if you read between the lines, he's saying, I love you. So maybe in a weird way, you're also in a, in a polyamorous relationship, except I guess, I don't know if it counts if, the other, if one of the people doesn't know that they're involved. <laughs> right, that's exactly it. I'm not sure if it counts. If, if I think it's just cheating. I don't know how that will work out with the marquee if and when I meet somebody that I want to be with. I actually am seeing somebody. Right, like a regular person. So, yeah. Uh, uh, what do we call them? Uh, a civilian. <laughs> yes, yeah, civilian. That's exactly it. It's a civilian. Have you told this person? That no. Will you ever tell them? Or well, okay. Um, is the question about the marquee, or is the question about a sugar babying? I guess we have discussed it as a topic, but not as something I have done. Uh -huh. So we've been over the topic, and while he's not super prone to judging these things, I definitely think he would have a problem with my having done that. He's just not comfortable like hearing about the people that I've slept with or my exes or those types of things. So I sort of keep that on the lower end of the radar. So your 
kind of thing for plan for going ahead if it, if it carries on working out with him mm-hmm. is is just to just not mention it. I also have this thing about what I did before is my business and what I do when I'm with you is yours. And how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that's it's that part is totally the sugar baby thing is is no big deal in terms of not mentioning it. It's like my sugar daddy is sort of gone underground in terms of like being found out by him. Like I know where he is, I know what he's doing, but it's it's not a secret. My secrets guard themselves, so to speak. But in terms of the marquee, that's that's sort of a different story because at some point this may turn serious, and I would have to say, listen, marquee, this is this is done. What did she say? This is done. Her voice is very soft in the recording here, and I'm reeling a bit trying to reconcile what she's just told me, that she considers herself married to the Marquis, and yet she's trying to gear herself up to telling him she's capable of leaving him for this civilian. Right. So at this point, you're still sleeping or seeing the Marquis, but you've just started seeing a new person who's a civilian. Are you just going to wait until the tide turns in this new civilian's favor, either one way or the other? And you decide either to sort of dump him or, or, or like you break up for mutual reasons or whatever, or you start feeling more for him than you do for the Marquis. And then in which I, case? I think it's going to be a matter, a little bit of both. Either the tide is going to turn for him and I'm going to be like, you know, this is this is the person. Or like, I'll probably feel like this is the person, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And the Marquis and I will have to have a very serious discussion. I'm rooting for this mystery civilian, but to be honest, I'm not sure anyone could detach Madeline from the Marquis. Now I have to, like, lower the axe. (laughs) He he knows it's out there. Do you think that there's a part of him that's just like, nah, she'll always love me? I'm sure that there's a part of him that thinks that I will always love him. I'm sure that that's true. But the, the thing that I think has changed for him is the sense that it doesn't matter if I love him or not. I have to take care of myself and my own needs. The reason that I know that he's sincere is that the second the man is in my presence, whatever it is that we're doing, I can read his mood. I can read what he's doing or saying, or read his sincerity. And I feel like I've heard him spew some crap to me. And I've also heard him be very sincere and honest. And this all comes across as very sincere and honest to me. I say this with love, but I have my doubts about that. How do you feel about this new person? I know, how, how early days is it? It's still somewhat new. And we've been seeing each other for probably a couple of months. So it's hard to tell where that will go. Right, exactly. What are your impressions? Do you do you feel like he's somebody that you could love? I do think that he's somebody that I could love. And that's, I guess, is the, the key to polyamory. I mean, you could discuss this with Ruby a bit, bit better, is that I feel something that tells me that it's, I love him, I adore him, but it's not the same. The, the love is not the same. So either it grows or it doesn't. That's sort of what I'm waiting on. I like the fact that you are open to it, though. I think the profound difference between the last time that we had a discussion about your love life was that I just felt that you could not look at any other men. Whereas I feel like from listening to you now, it sounds like you you are open. Like you said, you're you're open to the possibility of letting someone else in. I know that if I just keep myself closed off and you know, don't keep myself open to those possibilities, like the marquee will swallow me up and not by his own choice, it just will. So now I'm sort of taking control of that situation and started seeing other people. And if it works out, it works out. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. But at some point, either I'm going to say to him for tactical reasons, 
this has to stop or my feelings will be such that it just has to stop. Looking back at all your sugar baby experiences, would you do it all again? Yeah, I definitely, I met some interesting people. And then when I did find the surfer, our relationship was very fun and interesting. And I learned a lot from him. Obviously, he knows a great deal about finances and world travel and all all sorts of things that I'm sort of interested or lacking in my life. So he was he was a very good experience. Some of the, the overall nonsense that comes with it, I could do without. But there were there were some good things that came out of it. So yeah, I would do it again. And finally, so so were some of the good things that you you've been able to be a bit more financially secure? Are you in a good place in your life right now? Like just uh, generally, <laughs> your life outside of the sugar baby thing. I do feel I feel a bit more financially secure. I mean, I, overall, I feel much better than probably the last time that we spoke. Yeah, I feel like I'm in an emotionally good place. And I had some good experiences. I had some bad ones. I learned a lot about reading people and knowing who they were like right away. And I wouldn't trade that. That that was really good information to have. And I had I did some really cool things with people. So you know, those that's all good stuff. I asked Madeline how she thinks she'll feel once the podcast is done. Will it be weird listening back to herself and Ruby? It will be definitely interesting to see where we've come from in yeah. the past year and a half because I know that I feel very differently than I did back then. Yeah, you sound more, I don't know, it's like a quality of gravitas. <laughs> you got some, you got you some gravitas, girl. <laughs> I, I don't know if I would call it gravitas, but I, I think what it is is that I'm, I'm just much more comfortable with the way things are, with the way things are going. I'm not looking for the marquee to fulfill all of my relationship type needs. It's not just that I, I know that, he knows it. And that has made a huge difference. Yeah, well, that's good. I mean, I think the most important thing is for you in, in yourself to be like, actually, you don't need any of these guys. Right, you know, that's From exactly. what I know of you right now, it seems like you are doing so bloody well and by yourself. Uh, like you're doing it. You have created something. You've, you, you're busy. Can I say that you bought a house and stuff like because that I feel like that and you basically single-handedly doing it up from the ground up <laughs> I would say not single-handedly I do have a lot of people to help me but I don't have anyone in my life who's who's totally sharing that with me so or sharing the burden I guess mm. so because of of my regular job I'm exposed to a lot of people in a different trade and so I have their assistance and their expertise to sort of learn from and so it's not and I have not ever felt like I was going this alone but I do I do feel like this is mine and no one's going to take it from me and it's a much more grounded situation in my mind than than renting a house or you know having something you know living off of someone else so in every relationship that i've ever been in every serious relationship someone else has been the breadwinner someone else has basically made sure that i could live there and that is not my situation anymore well i think that's amazing and i think there's something interesting symbolically about your own house doing everything yourself picking out the stuff you're gonna have you're putting your sweat into it it's you it's coming from you it's and it represents something you know it represents a stable nest for you a safe haven i just walk in and i feel so safe and so comfortable and you know sometimes i get very lazy about doing things <laughs> like working on the house because i just want to sit and enjoy it it has been totally gutted it has come back together i've done so so much work and put so much of myself into it i've been the filthiest i've ever been in my whole life covered in dirt from removing the ceilings i've been terrified of different kinds of saws that i i know how to use them all now i know how to like cut cut a proper miter and it these are things that like not necessarily every homeowner knows like most people have to call in an expert for that kind of stuff and and now i know how to do it so it's been sort of a huge like journey for me amazing well that's great to hear i'm really happy about that thank I you mean, it's good to to find you in a in a better place you know 
not that you were in a terrible place before, but you know, it, it feels. I had my days. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, that's officially it for the podcast. And thank you so much for contributing. Uh, it was my pleasure. Here's to a great love in your life, in whatever form that takes, whether it's bricks and mortar. <laughs> no, just kidding. Yeah, no, no, it's, also it's, human it's, love. <laughs> and order, and that's, I'm pretty comfortable with that. But, you know, it would be, it would be nice. It would be interesting, you know, at some point to have somebody to share that with. But if it doesn't happen anytime soon, I'm, I'm really okay with that. I'm very comfortable with where I am. There's a calmness to Madeline's voice that makes me happy, despite the fact that the Marquis is still clinging to her heart like a barnacle. I have hoped that, for the first time in a long while, Madeline is allowing the sunlight in, through the brand new skylight she's just had put in her new house. <laughs> but seriously, I can sense that something has changed with her perhaps on a deeper level than she herself is aware of. And though in the beginning, I didn't rate our mystery civilian's chances of evicting the ghost of relationships past, by the end of our conversation, I changed my mind. I like to picture her in her little house, cozy and happy, as the traffic goes by making whale noises, as though she's in the hub of her own ship, reaching for the compass, her heart setting a course for new adventures. Next time, we speak to Ruby. Like Madeline, we'll travel into the future to see what's happened between her, the Brit, and FP. Has her marriage been able to survive her love for the two very different men in her life? What sacrifices is Ruby willing to make to follow her heart? After everything they've gone through, can Ruby and FP's love for each other triumph? Find out on the final episode of the Sugar Baby Confessionals. This podcast was produced and edited by me, Sarah May Chusen, with help from Beth Keane and Mike Scott. The music you've heard in this podcast comes from Danny Green's albums Obituaries and Lyche, Laura Francis's EP Restless Bed of Water, as well as Kristen McClement's album The Wild Grips. Find out more about Lyche by going to leishmusic.com, that's L-A-I-S-H music.com, hear Kristen's work at kristenmcclement.com, and go to laurafrancismusic.com for more information about Laura. I hope you've enjoyed what we've been doing. If so, do let us know. If you have any questions for Ruby, email us on fablegazers at gmail.com. We'd like to create some bonus content for you once the season is complete. Tweet us at fable underscore gazers or take a peek at our lovely Instagram account. We're fablegazers, one word. Rating, reviewing and subscribing is very much appreciated and helps to keep us going. Names and details have been changed to protect the anonymity of those involved. This has been a Fable Gazers production.